look at our peripheral nervous system, including the peripheral nerves and the cranial nerves. So the peripheral nervous system is what we have outside of the brain, outside of the spinal cord, and outside of the brain stem. And so this is all of the receptors, all of the actual peripheral nerves, the efferents and afferent nerve fibers traveling to and from the cord itself. This is essentially the way that we have the ability to look into our world outside. It all begins with sensory receptors. And so these receptors themselves are going to respond to specific stimuli. And so they're going to be activated by a particular type of stimulus. And so it's going to be specific only to that particular stimulus itself. And then it's going to relay that information back to the central nervous system. And then we can respond to it and send information back out through the motor. So with that, we have different types of receptors for different types of information. And so we have things like mechanoreceptors. This is going to be things like our touch sensation. This is deformation of the actual receptor itself. We've got to push on it and that then allows it to fire off. We have thermoreceptors. Thermoreceptors can detect a change in temperature. So they're going to detect when a change has occurred. It's either gotten warmer or colder. They can't tell us in a sense what the actual temperature is. Photoreceptors tell us that light has hit the retina. And so photoreceptors we use for vision. Chemoreceptors can be both from outside the body as well as inside the body. And so this gives us information about things that we can smell and taste, as well as things that we find inside the blood. And so we can have different chemistries inside there as well as along the digestive tract. Nociceptors respond to painful stimuli. And so when we're damaging tissue in some way, nociceptors will fire off. We can divide these receptors up into things like external receptors and internal receptors. External receptors are things that are found outside of the body. And so the receptors are responding to a stimulus that arose from the body. It's outside the body itself. So these are things that are on the skin. So on the surface of the body, um, this is all of our general senses, our special senses for the body itself. Internal receptors, for the most part, the internal receptors are going to be things that are all unconscious. And so this is information that is coming from within the body. And so this is everything from the digestive tract, respiratory tract, uh, blood vessels, cardiovascular system, anything and everything that we're monitoring inside the body is being helped out by interoreceptors. Proprioceptors are specialized receptors for sensing body position sense. And so this is going to be information that is supplied for the position of our joints, our tendons, our ligaments, our muscles, the skin around those joints and ligaments. Um, this is all about where the body is at any given time. This is both conscious as well as unconscious information. We can look at the actual receptors themselves and look at how they are in a sense kind of built. And so we can have receptors that are either classified as being simple or complex. And so most of them are simple. The simple ones are responding to the stimulus that is there. There's really no kind of difference in the type of stimulus that is being detected. Whereas with our special senses, we have complex receptors. These can have qualities to the receptors themselves. And so we can have different grades in a sense of the type of, of sensation that is being received. So how do we get this information from the receptors all the way up to the brain so that we have the ability to uh, perceive the actual information that is being received by the receptors themselves. And so in order for us to actually understand that something has happened, it has to get all the way up to the cortex for perception to occur. And so we've got to get that information all the way up there in order for us to have this perception of the particular stimulus that is there. So when we look at the somatosensory system itself, we have our different types of receptors. We have our external receptors, our proprioceptors, and our internal receptors. And we have kind of different levels of ability to modify or change and integrate that information. So we start at the receptors themselves. And so we have receptor level 
modification that can occur. And so this occurs at the actual receptors themselves. And so they can stop responding to a particular stimulus. We're going to have the circuit level. Circuit level is going to look at essentially the pathway from inside the cord on up. And then perceptual level is within the cortex itself. And so this is where we're going to interpret the information that has actually come in. So at the receptor level, we have information that is coming in and depending upon how much of the receptive field is being stimulated is going to give us an idea for how much of the area is involved. And so this is going to allow us to get our initial stimulus to be converted into graded potentials, which then get converted into action potentials. And those action potentials then send up information from those receptors about what is actually happening at that level. If the, con the stimulus is constant, and so if the stimulus is unchanging in terms of the type of stimulus, so imagine things like wearing a uh, ring, jewelry, glasses, a hat even, that pressure is constant onto the receptors, the receptors become less responsive. They stop sending off the action potentials. And so they don't send them as frequently as they uh, were in the past. And in the lab, we do this as an experiment to put coins on the back of the hand and have the person close their eyes and see when they stop sensing that the coins are actually there. This process of decreasing sensitivity is what we call adaptation. And so in some places, adaptation is quick. And so we're going to have a very quick process for this. And this is why we do it on the back of the hand, because pressure receptors have a quick adaptation. They fairly quickly stop telling us about the things that are going on. Um, even things like our clothing. As we wear clothes, we have this idea that they're there, but we don't necessarily feel them constantly on the surface of the skin itself. One of the other big ones that adapts fairly quickly is the, the sense of smell and taste. And so our overall adaptation there is fairly quickly. Think of chewing gum. The flavor of that gum goes away fairly quickly. Slow adaptation is going to occur oftentimes with our interoreceptors. And so that we don't, in a sense, kind of forget about things like the chemistry in the blood. We don't want to forget that that is happening there. Out in the skin, we have things like our Merkel's receptors and our Rufidine corpuscles. Um, those are going to be more for the slow adaptation as well. Both pain receptors and proprioceptors do not adapt. And so we don't want to not know about pain. And we always need to know exactly where our body is at any given time. So once those receptors have fired off, we're now going to send that information up towards the brain. And so this process is going to run through three separate neurons. And so we have what we call our first order neurons, our second order neurons, and our third order neurons, or our primary, secondary, and tertiary neurons. Those neurons are going to be found in slightly different places. Um, and we'll look at the cell bodies or the soma for where that actually is. So for our first order neurons, their soma are found in the dorsal root ganglion or in the cranial nerves. And so the ganglia for them or the the receptors that go into the cranial nerves in the brain stem itself. Those then fire on a second order neuron, and that second order neuron is either going to be in terms of its cell body, either in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, or they're going to be somewhere within the brain stem. And so they're going to be somewhere within the medullary nuclei. And that information is then going to be transmitted up to the thalamus or cerebellum, where it then synapses again. From there, our third order neurons, their cell bodies are located in the thalamus. And so our little traffic cop of the brain, we're going to send that information from the thalamus all the way up to the cerebral cortex. And that information now becomes perceived. We're now at the, the perception level of processing. From the thalamus, the thalamus is going to project up to our somatosensory cortex. We're going to know where it happened on the body. We're going to know what type of sensation it is. And then we need to send that information over to the association areas. The association areas then need to know about it. And we can then 
put in a sense kind of a label on the type of information that was there where did we find this information have we come across it in the past uh, what type of stimulus is it is it combined with other types of information uh, the touch the temperature the amount of pressure is it vibrating all of that information gets interpreted and we have our final kind of image of the stimulus and so that image of the stimulus is kind of our mind's eye view of what is exactly in a sense uh, impacting our body at that point so when it comes to perception uh, the information that is there has to come in so for perceptual detection itself we've got to have summation of all of the action potentials and this is going to bring that information in we're going to have an idea of how much of a stimulus there was and so we're going to do our magnitude estimation was it a strong stimulus was it a soft stimulus and then we have spatial discrimination where exactly on the body did this occur where did the the body get stimulated at that particular time and there we start to come into combine some information and so we can identify the substance that has the a specific texture or shape um, to it we can start to put information together about it um, in terms of that information is it soft is it smooth is it hard uh, things like that we can then in some of our sensations for our special senses especially we have quality discrimination and so is it sour sweet sour salty or bitter for taste is it high pitched is it low pitched for uh, hearing things like that and then we put all of it kind of together is there a particular pattern that we can kind of recognize within that information itself it could be something like a familiar face but it also could be a familiar shape digging around in your bag for your keys or for your pen or pencil something like that um, becomes a familiar shape that it is that we can recognize from the past the nerves that are within the peripheral nervous system do have the potential to become damaged so as we kind of go through our uh, life the cells themselves may become damaged and if that damage occurs within the axons uh, we have the potential to repair them if the soma is damaged the process itself is not going to be able to be repaired and so if the soma of a damaged neuron is intact we can potentially repair it but if that soma gets damaged if the cell body becomes damaged there's nothing that's going to be able to save it because those cells are amitotic they can't reproduce themselves and so we need to be able to simply repair the extensions the processes and not the actual cell body in order for this to occur we have a series of processes that are going to come into play and so if we damage this neuron and so here we have our site of damage itself and one of the first things that's going to start to happen is everything that is distal to the damage is going to die in terms of that axon the Schwann cells that are there are going to wall off and seal the end for the area that has been damaged macrophages are going to come in they're going to start to gobble up all of the damaged potentially Schwann cells potentially parts of the axon itself um, that's there perhaps the neuron was cut perhaps the neuron was crushed uh, we don't know how exactly it happened at that particular point from there those Schwann cells are going to start to develop what's called a neural to a regeneration tube and so this regeneration tube is going to start to essentially travel along the pathway of that neuron and recreate that tube that it lies in so we're going to have our Schwann cells recreating our myelin sheath they're going to surround that axon as it regrows and it's going to make its way out to where it originally was the problem with this in a sense is that it's relatively slow we get about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half a day and in order to get it out to where it needs to go so it may take some time in order for that sensation to come back or, or whatever the the motor control to come back potentially um, if it was a, a innervating a muscle that muscle may be innervate de-innervated for too long and the muscle may not be able to respond anymore even if the nerve gets back to the muscle itself 
for sensation, uh, we may or may not get back to those receptors the way they were. If the wound itself is kind of offset from each other, so if they're no longer kind of approximating each other well, uh, the neurons, as they start to regrow back out, they may not find the exact spot on the skin uh, where they used to innervate. And that can lead to a bit of either decreased sensation or altered sensation at the site of the injury. Moving on to look at the cranial nerves. And so for the cranial nerves, we have 12 cranial nerves themselves. Uh, each one is found in a slightly different location along the brainstem, with the exception of the olfactory nerves and the optic nerves. And so the olfactory nerve itself is actually coming out of this olfactory bulb. And so kind of the little dark dots there would be where the uh, nerves would be exiting those olfactory bulbs for those. The optic tract here would continue on out towards the eyeballs as well. And those are the only two that don't have their nuclei and their origins on the brainstem itself. All the others will have their exit from the brainstem rather than directly from the brain like the first two. In remembering the order of the cranial nerves, uh, there are many, many different mnemonics out there to try and help you do so, uh, and you can search up many of them. Uh, some of them go O, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet, such heaven. And so the first letter of each of those words goes along, along with the first letter of the individual cranial nerves themselves. Um, you can look at other ones that may uh, work well for you. Uh, there are many, many out there to look at, or even make up your own. So for the cranial nerves, each of the cranial nerves themselves has typically a little bit of sensory function, um, possibly some motor function uh, within them, depending upon the particular cranial nerve themselves. And so some of them have both sensory and motor. Some of them have just sensory. Some of them have just motor. So you can see within the chart there for each one. So our first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve, um, this is the nerve itself is going to arise from the olfactory epithelium, and then it's going to go through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, and as it goes up through that cribriform plate, it's going to meet the olfactory bulb, and so it's a very short nerve. It is also many, many nerves, and so the olfactory nerve is carrying sensory information for smell, and the nerves themselves, all of these individual little fibers here are, in a sense, the actual uh, olfactory nerve itself. And they just go up through the little foramen in the cribriform plate. And they go through those little holes there. And that then comes up to the olfactory bulb. They synapse. And in a sense, that's the end of the, the olfactory nerve from the olfactory bulb through to the olfactory tract, and then making its way back into the brain. The second cranial nerve, the optic nerve, this one is going to essentially be the extensions of our neurons from the retina itself. And so this is going to come back, and all of the axons are going to join together into the optic nerve. The optic nerve then goes back through the optic canal. From the optic canal, it's going to meet up at the optic chiasm. So we come back. Half of the information is going to cross over to the other side. Half of the information is going to stay on the same side. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about the cranial or the special senses on there. And then from the optic chiasm through the optic tract, come back into the thalamus. From there, synapse and send information back into the primary visual cortex all the way back in the occipital lobe. And then we have perception of vision. Next up, we have the first of three cranial nerves that controls the extrinsic muscles of the eye, the oculomotor nerve. Oculomotor nerve controls four of our six extrinsic muscles of the eye. And so it's going to have the majority of control over the eye itself. And so it controls our superior rectus, our medial rectus, our inferior rectus, and our inferior oblique muscles. Uh, when this muscle is 
when these muscles are innervated, they're going to help with movement of the eye in almost all directions for them. If we should take oculomotor out, and so if we have a problem with oculomotor, one of the first things we're going to see is ptosis. And so we're going to see drooping of the eyelid if the person's oculomotor nerve is not functioning properly. And then from there, we're going to see the eye not be able to move inward. And so it's not going to be able to, to be drawn in towards the nose itself. It does also innervate two intrinsic muscles. And so both of these muscles deal inside the eye, the ciliary muscles controlling the lens, and then our constrictor pupillae muscle dealing with the constriction of the uh, pupils themselves. So because it's doing constriction, that means that it's also controlling parasympathetic fibers coming into the eye as well. So here we can see it coming in uh, from the junction between the, the pons and the midbrain and making its way through the superior orbital fissure and then out to innervate all of those muscles. Next up, we have the trochlear nerve. The trochlear nerve innervates another of our extrinsic eye muscles it innervates superior oblique only and so its uh, function is going to be almost entirely nervous and so it's going to have motor functions on there and it innervates that superior oblique muscle to allow the eye to turn uh, down and out as it innervates it again comes in through the superior orbital fissure the trochlear nerve is unique because it originates here from the posterior aspect of the brainstem. It's the only one that comes from the far back of the brainstem itself. We're going to pause a moment on the muscles that are innervating the eye muscles, or the nerves that are innervating the eye muscles, and we're going to jump to the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve is going to serve the face for sensation. And so this nerve actually has three separate divisions, <clears throat> depending upon where it goes to the face itself. And so depending upon where it needs to innervate, we have an ophthalmic division, a maxillary, and a mandibular, also referred to as V1, V2, and V3. They're going to come into the area in slightly different areas as well, and so they're going to get out to the face from slightly different spots. So it's actually going to split before it leaves the skull itself and so v1 comes out through that superior orbital fissure again we see that that's a busy place the foramen rotundum is going to allow for v2 to exit and then foramen oval is going to allow for v3 to exit and so it's going out to the different areas of the face itself giving sensation to regions for v1 v2 and V3, so ophthalmic, essentially doing the area around the eye, our maxillary doing area around the maxilla, and then mandibular doing the area around the mandible. It also has a motor function. It's going to control the muscles of mastication, and so our chewing muscles are also going to be innervated here by the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve, because it does provide uh, sensory information to the face. If it does become damaged in some way, uh, it can start to lead to sometimes tic du la rue. And so tic du la rue is an inflammatory condition of the trigeminal nerve. It most often affects V1 and V2. And essentially it causes a momentary pain. And so it's almost like described as being a burning type pain or a stabbing type pain in the supply of V1 or V2 usually. And so it's going to cause this, this horrible, horrible pain uh, that is going to be on that part of the face. And it can be stimulated by just simply a breeze, uh, hair flowing over the, the face. A, a mild stimulus is interpreted as this huge amount of pain stimulus. Uh, and this can gets to the tick part because the person usually winces when they, when they have that pain occur. And it can lead to the actual ending up cutting of that nerve in order to stop the pain from happening. We go back to our extrinsic eye muscles and we have abducens. Abducens is going to control lateral rectus. So abducens, named after essentially the action of lateral rectus, it's going to abduct the eye and so it's going to turn it outward. Uh, this muscle here 
is going to be innervated solely by lateral rectus and essentially that's all that lateral rectus does it comes out through that superior orbital fissure and makes its way to the lateral rectus muscle so if, if abducens is no longer functioning the abduction of the eye is going to be altered back to the face in terms of the whole face we have our facial nerve facial nerve is now going to be motor to the face and so it's going to do uh, the muscles of facial expression is going to be its primary process and so it's going to give us our our facial expression all the movements that we can do to all of the muscles that line the face itself and so smiling raising eyebrows etc all of that is innervated by the facial nerve it also does do taste and so it does have a sensory component to it and so it's going to get information out to the tongue and it's going to do the anterior two-thirds of the tongue for taste and so here we have the innervation to the tongue for taste it also innervates our glands and so it does have a parasympathetic component to it as well and so it's innervating those salivary glands there and then from there we have all of our facial muscles involved in making facial expressions there if our facial nerve becomes damaged and we have paralysis to those muscles oftentimes this is single-sided and so Bell's palsy is usually a one-sided uh, problem and most of the time it's got an unknown cause the person in a sense kind of wakes up and all of a sudden the one side of their face doesn't work and it's not a stroke it's just that they don't have control over the muscles on that one side lots of different theories as far as the cause um, everything from bacterial infections to viral infections um, trauma can cause it as well get hit in the side of the face things like that uh, all have the potential for causing the issue itself oftentimes it does resolve on its own and so it's going to go away without really any much of any kind of treatment at all um, perhaps if we can identify what the actual cause is that can bring about a shorter period of time of recovery next up we have our eighth cranial nerve we have the vestibular cochlear nerve so vestibular cochlear it's going to the inner ear so this is going to provide for both a vestibular component and a cochlear component and so we're going to have our hearing and balance being innervated by the vestibular cochlear nerve itself kind of two nerves in one uh, the vestibular cochlear nerve as it makes its way in to the inner ear through the internal acoustic meatus it then splits into two separate divisions there and so we have the cochlear nerve going out to the cochlea and then we have the vestibular nerve going out to the semicircular canals and the vestibule of the inner ear and so those are going to provide for balance information and the cochlear nerve is going to give us our hearing information next up we have glossopharyngeal glossopharyngeal is now going to provide us with the additional component of taste uh, it's going to give us sensory to the posterior one-third of the tongue and so it's going to innervate the the back half of the tongue uh, so to speak there it does have motor components as well and so it innervates actually part of the tongue itself and so it's going to innervate part of the the motor components to the the tongue and then it's also going to supply part for our salivary glands as well specifically going out to the parotid gland so it's going to supply there as well so sensory to the tongue sensory to the soft palate coming into the the back of the throat there we then have the parotid gland getting its parasympathetic information as well the vagus nerve is our one cranial nerve that is going to actually leave the head and neck all the other cranial nerves are going to stay in the head and neck the vagus the great wanderer is going to essentially move down into the thorax and into the abdomen and touch just about every single 
component for our internal organs. So it sends down motor fibers that are parasympathetic in nature, and this is essentially hitting all of our internal organs. And so it's getting everything involved in that. Sensory side of things is for taste, and so it's going to pick up taste to the back of the throat. So it's going to come back into the back of the throat here, and we're going to get some taste into the back of the throat. We're also going to get some motor into the back of the throat there as well. And then it sends off a branch here that's going to come down and enter into the thorax. This is going to be our vagus nerve providing for parasympathetic information to all of our internal organs. And so all of them are getting their, their parasympathetic control coming down from the vagus nerve. The accessory nerve, or spinal accessory nerve, this is now going to have a component that is both cranial, so we have a cranial root, and then we also have a spinal root. And so it actually brings information up from the spinal cord. And so the spinal root itself is actually going to come back up into the skull via the foramen magnum and make its way back up into the cranium itself as it comes on up. This is going to primarily be a motor function. Um, this is sometimes referred to kind of like the I don't know muscle. And so this is going to cause rotation of the head as well as uh, shrugging of the shoulders. And so it innervates the trapezius muscle and the sternocleidomastoid. So we can shrug our shoulders and turn our head side to side with those two muscles that are there. So it comes in, uh, innervates the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius. We can see here the spinal roots making their way back up along the spinal cord through that foramen magnum and then making their way up through the, the brainstem. They pick up the cranial roots and those cranial roots, roots then join in and combine together and then exit out through the jugular foramen and accessory nerve is going to come down and innervate those two muscles, our sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. Last up, we have the hypoglossal nerve. Hypoglossal, glossus meaning tongue, hypo meaning below. So we're now coming in below the tongue itself. And so the hypoglossal nerve is going to innervate the muscles of the tongue, both intrinsic and extrinsic muscles uh, for the tongue itself. This is going to allow us to move our tongue side to side, up and down, uh, stick our tongue out, things like that. So as the hypoglossal nerve comes in, it innervates both the extrinsic muscles of the tongue and then the actual intrinsic muscles of the tongue, allowing us to move the tongue for chewing, for speech, uh, move food, a food bolus back to the back of the throat for swallowing. Um, all of that is controlled by the hypoglossal nerve itself. There are two hypoglossal nerves, so each side of the tongue is innervated by two separate nerves and so we have one nerve coming in from one side and then another nerve coming in from the other side so we can have damage to a single side and that one side of the tongue is not going to function properly but the other side of the tongue will function just fine and so we'll see depending upon what is causing it, we may see flaccid paralysis on one side of the tongue and perfectly working tongue on the other side.